This is Andy Johnson with the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. I'm part of a small crew aboard the research vessel Tekla. We've just spent the last 30 hours sailing the Bering Sea to arrive here. St. Matthew Island on the Alaska Maritime National Wildlife Refuge. There are some unique birds that only nest in this area. and We're hoping to film and record their breeding behavior for the first time. St. Matthew won't be giving up its secrets easily. It's an uninhabited outpost of tall, jagged pinnacles. Steep talus slopes spilling onto rocky beaches and thousands of acres of tundra valleys. By some measures, this is the most remote wilderness in the country. Refuge biologists collect long-term data on bird populations, which are essential to tracking changes in the ocean ecosystem. And for the first time in six years, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service sent a team here for a month to survey the island's bird life. St. Matthew is critical for the birds arriving here. Past studies have found nearly 140 species on the island. Most are passing through, but for many, safe nesting sites and nutrient-rich waters make it perfect habitat to breed and raise young. The Alaska Maritime National Wildlife Refuge is a collection of protected lands spread across the coasts. Thousands of refuge islands provide habitat to around 40 million seabirds. Established as one of the first refuges in 1909, St. Matthew Island sits isolated, more than 200 miles from the mainland. Over 77,000 acres stretch 30 miles long and just a few miles across. We've only seen a fraction of the island but with 18 hours of daylight, we should be able to finish our work. Stephanie Walden and Bryce Robinson are from the Alaska Maritime National Wildlife Refuge. And Rachel Richardson is from the U.S. Geological Survey's Alaska Science Center. One of their assignments is to resurvey two birds of interest, the Pribilof rock sandpiper and the McKay's bunting. It's been, you know, 15 years since anyone's been out to study these birds again. And really what we want to do is get a handle on the, on the populations. We want to know what the status of both of these populations are. My colleague from the Cornell Lab, Irby Lovett, and I are trying to film their behavior and record their songs. But so far, we're becoming more familiar with land animals than birds. St. Matthew singing voles, found only on this island, are our ever-present companions. They're close to camp, and we seem to hear their alarm calls everywhere we walk. Voles are one of the main prey items for the island's other resident mammals, red and arctic foxes. They scour the island on a constant search for food. Every moment is valuable, and we're constantly on the lookout for the birds. We come across the sandpipers, the first of our two study subjects, in wide tundra valleys. but their nests are tougher to spot. A 
Adults brood their chicks in the lichens and mosses, perfectly camouflaged. And for good reason. Less than a hundred yards away, long-tailed Jaegers are also nesting and patrolling the tundra. They'll eat sandpiper eggs and young. So to find cover, these exposed chicks need to move quickly, just hours after hatching. Nearby sedge meadows keep them better hidden from predators. To find McKay's bunting's nests, we rely on key features of the landscape. Essentially, if you have a nice rock crevice, a big talus slope, then you've got McKay's breeding habitat. When we see those rock ridges out on the landscape, we target those for McKay's buntings. We know they're going to be there. It doesn't take long before they show themselves. These birds nest nowhere else on Earth. Early expeditions described the buntings like snowflakes in the sky. It's a behavior seen only in the early breeding season. Males perform this beautiful arcing display flight, singing as they float down to advertise a choice crevice. And if they're lucky, an interested female will inspect the site's potential for building a nest. We watch as she gathers a bill full of bright feathers to line the deep crevice. We got this fiberscope camera here. It's got a little LED light on the end, which is super nice for going into the crevices since they're pretty dark in there. Um, so it'll light up and we can get accurate counts of eggs. Uh, we know how many nestlings hatch and then we can sort of follow them throughout their cycle. And I can count four, but I'll make a little noise and see if they'll gape at me. There we go. One, two, three, and number four. There we go. And number five. Oh my goodness. Actually, that's incredible. Five egg clutch, all five hatched, looking good. That's really all I need, so that's quick. That's awesome. The biologists are monitoring dozens of nests across the island, watching flecks of white disappear into the dark rocks. We're noticing the chicks stay hidden in the nest for nearly two weeks after hatching, much longer than expected for a small songbird. It seems like the buntings are taking full advantage of the safety of these deep crevices. Once the chicks finally leave, they're already capable flyers. McKay's bunting and rock sandpiper have adapted to their island over millennia. But they face an uncertain future. In spite of St. Matthew's extreme isolation, it's still vulnerable to the effects of climate change as the Arctic warms. There's no telling what future expeditions we'll find here, but it will certainly be different from what we are seeing. Still, we're leaving St. Matthew in awe of what we've found. All of the things that our team is seeing, not that many people will ever get a chance to see. 
And so it is up to us to bring these stories back, bring these images back, and let people know that this place is special, these birds are worth protecting, and this work is worth doing. Thank you.